My title today is Israel and Hamas. Um, we are hopeful. We hope for redemption. We really hope for redemption, right? Uh, we saw some some hostages uh, being released in the last days. We saw the ceasefire, but but still, we have so many pictures in our minds when we look eastwards to what's happening in the Gaza and Israel and all around the planet, actually, with all the demonstrations, people in the streets shouting, free Palestine. And we picked up this, um, these events all around the world and we said, let's talk about it. Let's bring, let's bring biblical focus and perspective into it. So when we talk today, I believe God is going to bring you hope and bring me hope and bring hope into the situation by really bringing biblical perspective. What we saw, what we've been seeing in the last weeks is one thing um, that really encourages me is the first Peter chapter four, where we read the following thing. I want to read it to you. The end of the world is coming soon. That doesn't sound really good, right? But actually, when things come to an end, and not just to an end, but reach their goal, then it's great, okay? The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. In other translations, it says, be alert, be awake, be ready, okay? And we've seen this shofar horn. That's, that's a, a symbol for awakeness, to be alert, to be earnest. Because when Jews blow the shofar horn, they mean three things. They say for the first, get up, change and be, leave your lazy lifestyle actually. Get out of bed, okay? So this is really a wake up call, like boop, wake up, it's time to get out of bed. The second thing it says is uh, it's um, turn your turn around and submit to God. Be, um, yeah, come to God and bring, bring your honest sights. Turn around. And that's, that's what it also says. It's, it's called um, repentance, actually. Thank you, Dan. So good to have you in the first row. <laughs> repent. It's a wake-up call to repent and also to get in the army of God. That's what the wake-up call, like the shofar horn, means. And when we talk about the end times, when we talk about the events all around the world, we want to hear and listen to First Peter. He says, be alert, be earnest, also in your prayers. Maybe now you say, okay, Michi, that's nice uh, with your shofar horn, but uh, it's almost Christmas. I want to get out my Christmas carol. I want to set up the tree and have a cozy tea and a coffee in my living room. <laughs> Is there anyone like that? Yeah, many of us, okay. Yeah, you can be courageous, be honest in church. <laughs> Uh, how does it fit together with what we're talking about? Be alert, be earnest. I want to give you a perspective with the gate of Jerusalem. Join me to the gate of Jerusalem. It's one of the 12 that were originally there in Jerusalem. Jerusalem had 12 gates, and this is the East Gate, also called the Golden Gate of Jerusalem. So let's meet. This is ICF English community. This is the East Gate. Hello. Hello, okay. And this is going to be the place where hope comes from today. I really believe God is going to release hope in our hearts, hope for, hope for redemption. The East Gate is the place where priests went in and out. It was faced towards the Olive Mountain, Mount Olive, Mount of Olives, uh, on the east side of Jerusalem, and the priests went in and out, and it was the closest gate to the temple, to the Holy of the Holies. So this is the place where hope is going to come today. Are you ready for some hope? All right, get ready. I want to take uh, quite, a, quite a lot of time in the message to talk about prophecies in the Bible. Because when we talk about end times, it has to do with prophecy, okay? Nobody really knows. And it's a time um, that is still to come. And it's not everything is in the past, okay? We're going to look in the past and we want to read the Bible to understand what we're going to and where we're going to. There is two appearances of the Messiah in the Bible. And when, when first Peter writes about the end times, the, the end time is near, he talks about the second coming of the reigning Messiah. Jesus came two times 
twice. So the first coming was the suffering Messiah. The second coming is the reigning Messiah. And before Jesus came on this planet, there were, in Israel, there were prophets, kings, and judges. We find many books in the Bible that give us insight about the history of Israel, and it's really great. And I want to um, pick out uh, one of a prophet, and this is Zechariah. Let us read in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Here he talks about the starting time. You see it here, starting time. It starts by the coming of the Messiah. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So it talks about the Messiah, the Son of God, not coming as a, as a king who, who acts like a king, but it's talking about uh, a victorious, but also lowly and riding on a donkey, Messiah. What happened when we look in the history? What, what did happen? This was written 400 years before Jesus came. What happened is exactly what is written in the Bible. Jesus entered Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. Why did he do that? You see it on the slide. I put four points. First of all, Jesus was really um, into, he, was, he was wanted to make sure that all the prophecies would be fulfilled. And I'm sure he did it on purpose. He sent out his disciples to look for a, for a donkey and he said, make it ready so I can ride on his back. And they made it ready. So that's the first point why he did it. The second thing, thing is he rode um, on a donkey because the donkey is the mound of the churches. Kings, they ride on a horse, like a, a, a war horse, okay? But a judge rode on a donkey's back back in those days. The donkey stands for justice, helpfulness, and humility. Kings ride the donkeys only when they want to make peace. As a sign here, I'm not on a, on a horse, I come on a donkey. So that's the facts number one. What do the prophecies say about the coming of Jesus um, in Ezekiel? When we read in Ezekiel, it comes to the gate, the east gate. I love the east gate. Let's read what is written about the east gate. Then the man brought me to the gate facing east, and I saw the glory of God of Israel coming from the east. So he brought him to the gate to the east. His voice was like the roar of rushing waters, and the land was radiant with his, with his glory. I fell face down. The glory of the Lord entered the temple through the gate facing east. So what we see here is exactly what was written in the prophecies about the first coming of the Messiah. He will be on the back of a donkey. He will ride from the east, from the Mount of Olives, and enter Jerusalem through the east gate, our beloved east gate, to the Holy of the Holies. And that's what happened when Jesus arrived. Isn't that great? That prophecies are so specific, and Jesus fulfills everything about it. When we read the Bible and let it sink for a while from the head to the heart. There was a king, the king of all the kings. He was riding on a donkey. What did he say by that? He said, I am the king, but I come humbly. I am here with a white flag, and I bring peace from the God of all the gods to you as a human being. I come with peace. I don't come on the back of a horse as a reigner. I come here with a peace flag. I say, I will make peace between the human race and God. What a great news. He said, I'm here as the judge, but I don't come as a judge to judge you and kill you, destroy you because you're full of sin. I'm here as a judge and I ride through the gate of redemption. That was the name of the East Gate. He rode through the gate of redemption where there's mercy, the gate of mercy in Jerusalem. When the church comes 
to give you mercy, then there's time to be joyful, right? That's the time to be joyful. And that's what Jesus did. And when he rode on the donkey, what did he see on the back of the donkey was the cross. It was his vision riding down from the Mount of Olives to the East Gate. And what looking at the back of the donkey was the cross. And it made sure he was aware that he is the Lamb of God. He comes as a humble king to serve humanity and take on the sins. Take on the death that was for us and he took it for us. What a great moment for the first coming of the Messiah. It was the coming in a humble and, and um, serving attitude. What about you? Is your gate open for the king of kings, for the judge who brings peace? Is it open? Do you know Jesus as the redeemer in your life? I really want to make sure you know him as your personal redeemer. When Jesus was in Jerusalem, he spent a lot of time teaching in the temple and he did that every day when he was in Jerusalem and the evenings he went up on the Mount of Olives and the, the, the disciples could ask him many, many questions and they asked him Above all, they asked him about the starting time and the end time. And I want to show you what Jesus said, because there, were, there had been 400 and more years that there was no prophecies before Jesus came. It was like God was quiet. It, he was silent. Nobody heard from God. And then when Jesus came, he was a prophet who started to talk and teach about the kingdom of God. And the disciples were hungry and thirsty and said, tell us more. What is going to happen in the earth? So they wanted to know what is going to happen in the starting time. What is the signs that, that what is going to happen next? And they wanted to know about the signs of the end time. What is going to happen when the earth comes to an end? And Jesus taught them every evening at the Mount of Olives. You can read it for yourself. I really want to recommend you to read Luke chapter 21, Matthew chapter 24. It gives a lot of insight about the prophecies Jesus made about the starting time and the end time. Jesus speaks about the starting time here in Luke tw uh, chapter 21. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea Flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out and let those in the country not enter the city. He was very specific what's going to happen. Jerusalem is going to be surrounded by the enemy. And when you see that happening, flee from the city. Don't enter it anymore. What happened in the next years? I want to zoom in on the starting time with the next slide. The starting time, of course, started with Jesus. And he talked about the situation in the year 68 after Christ. What happened there was that the armies of Rome really surrounded the city. And when people saw that, and there were all of them saw it, of course, but those who listened to what Jesus had said, they started to flee out of the city. How can you flee out of a city that's surrounded by the enemy? You might think now, a good question. What happened in 68 was that Nero, the, the, not the king, but the huh? Kaiser, emperor, the emperor of Rome, he um, committed suicide. And when he committed suicide, there was a chaotic um, years. I think it was two years that really chaotic. And until Rome was reorganized, it, was, it took two years until the year 70. And in the year 70, they were all organized, and Titus was the one who, who um, erased Jerusalem from the, from the face of the earth. And within the two years that were here, the Celtic time, were the time where the, the Jews who listened to what Jesus had said could flee to the mountains of Judea. And they took the Bible scrolls with them. That's the scrolls of Qumran. Maybe you heard about those. And they found it just um, around 80 years ago. And they were, they were brought there by the, by the Jews who believed in the Messiah. And all the others were destroyed in Jerusalem. What I want to tell you here is it is worth listening 
to the Word of God. It is worth listening to the prophecies that Jesus brings in our life. It should make us alert. It should be a wake-up call for us that because then what happened here will happen again in the end times. There were so many signs like Jesus died on the cross and he was resurrected, of course. That was also a sign. And then there was many other signs until 135 after the death of Christ, the final demise of the state of Israel. And all the Jews, many of them Messianic Jews who believed in Jesus, they, were, um, they went all around the world. They had to flee. And so the gospel of Jesus was spread all over the planet. That's about the starting time. What does Jesus say about the end times? Let's look at it. Um, Jesus spoke about the end times. In Matthew 24, verse 8, he says, All these are the beginning of birth pains. So describing the end times, Jesus uses the illustration like a birth, the birth pains. I didn't have the burn paints, but I saw how they are, and they're really strong. Who knows from the ladies here? Some of them are here who gave birth. It's a big respect to you. And when Jesus talks about the end times, let's have the next slide here. He talks about the time until his return. So it, when he talks about the birth, like the, the birth pains, He talks about waves. There's going to be waves like signs. And the more it comes to the birth, the closer and the more often those signs are going to happen like when you have the pains of a birth. Why did I write here 1822? In 1822, there, was, um, there were so many Jews fleeing from Russia because they started to, to um, how, how can I say it? Um, tried to, to kill many Jews, and there were 10,000 of Jews entering Israel, and that was a year when they started to reestablish in, in, the, in the Israel of today. And they came back, and the return of the Jews is one of the biggest signs in the Bible when we see today, for example, 1948, where the state of Israel was reestablished. And there's so many signs. And also in 1922, The Soviet Union was formed and they said, we are going to erase Christianity from the face of the earth. And communism caused hundreds, no, more than 100 million deaths of Christian people. Did you know that? We don't talk about it, but it's, it's a number that is huge. We talk about the Holocaust and we should, but what the communism did to Christianity, it was more than 100 million deaths. And the second, um, the second um, power that is erasing Christianity is Islamistic power. And we see that also today. Today, 360 million people, people are, are persecuted because of their faith in Jesus. And when Jesus talks about these pains, he talks about the end times. And we know it when we see what's happening in the world that we live in the end times, and Jesus will come back. What did Zechariah uh, tell you and tell us about the return of Jesus? You ready to hear that? It was written before he even came for the first time. And on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Again, there he is again, okay? It is again, the Mount of Olives. It's all happening in the east. And on, uh, he will stand on the Mount of Olives, which, which is before Jerusalem, toward, of course, the east. We know that. And the Mount of Olives will be divided in the middle from the east to the west into a very wide valley so that one half of the mountain will give way to the north and the other half to the south. What will happen When Jesus comes back for the first time, he will set his feet on the Mount of Olives and he will come with all the glory. It will not be on the back of a small donkey, okay? It will be in all the glory he has, in all the glory from heaven, he will return and every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that he is the Lord. 
And he will enter through the gates of Jerusalem with all the glory, and he will reign from Jerusalem again. So you see the gate, our beloved East Gate, is going to be in the center of the happenings of the events on this planet again. But the difference is, he will not come as a humble, as a humble servant, he will come as a king who will reign. Make sure that the day when Jesus comes back, you don't have a wall facing the king of kings. It won't be a problem for him because he can go through walls with his new body, but it will be a sign for him, don't enter, I'm closed. What about your walls in your heart? Are they open to the king of kings? Because the day when he returns, make sure that you are open for him, that you already belong to him, and your, your heart is not pricked against the king of kings. Yeah, we are in a fight because you all see this wall here is closed, right? You see that. <laughs> it's really bricked up. The time after Jesus' death and resurrection, Jerusalem was destroyed, and this is actually the place of war throughout the hundreds of years. Some, sometimes it was built up, then it was destroyed again. And in the year 1541, Suleiman, one of the Osmanian uh, emperors, he built the walls of Jerusalem back up, also the East Gate. But what he did, he bricked it up, he closed it. You know why he closed it? It's actually a bit funny. I had to smile when I, uh, when I read it. He bricked it up to make sure that the Messiah of the Jewish and the Messiah of the Christians won't be able to come back through the East Gate. He was a guy who knew about the beliefs we Christians and the Jewish people have, and he wanted to make sure it's bricked up and the Messiah won't enter. You know, he thought he will maybe come back on a donkey's back, <laughs> but he won't. He won't face the wall. He will come with all the glory, and there's no problem for the king of kings to go through a wall, right? So what he meant for evil, God turned for good. Because when you read the Bible in Ezekiel 44, what does it say there about our East Gate, <laughs> our beloved one? It says, then the man brought me back to the outer gate, okay, go back, of the sanctuary, the one facing east, okay, and it was shut. The Lord said to me, this gate is to remain shut. It must not be opened. No one may enter through it. It is to remain shut because the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered through it. It was the will of God that this gate will be shut because the king of king had entered there on a donkey's back and it should be shut until the day when he comes back in all his glory. So Suleiman, he bricked it up and he meant it for evil. But what he did, he helped God fulfill his prophecy until this day. It's, it's just great, right? It's just wonderful how God is. I want to invite you to make sure your, your wall is open for God. Because there is a war going on in our hearts. We, we are easily to, to break up our heart and against God. Also in the times we live in right now. And God wants to help us to take out those bricks. To take them out and give them to God. What happens in the East now, in Israel, in Gaza, it is so easy to get a, a bitter heart, to be full of anger, to be full of fear, to be actually full of hatred. And when we, when we open up our hearts to hatred, to fear, then we open up our hearts to the evil. And what does... I want to tell you what evil is translated in the Bible, in the first book, in Genesis chapter 6. I want to read to you. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of Hamas, which is the, that is the original word in Hebrew there, and it's translated by violence. It's called Hamas. 
God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with Hamas, with the violence, because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. Do you realize Hamas, the evil, the violence has been here for many hundreds and thousands of years. It just has a new face and a new group. It found new people who have bitter hearts. I don't want to blame them. I want to blame the evil, the father of the evil who tries to destroy this planet God meant for good. And he means the best for you as well. Make sure your heart is not bitter. Make sure you don't give space and room in your heart for Hamas, for, for the violence, for the evil. The Lord lives, it says in Psalm, praise, to be, praise be to my rock, exalted be God my Savior. He is the God who avenges me, who saves me from the violence of Hamas. You exalted me above my foes. From a violent man, you rescued me. You see on a slide how many times Hamas uh, is, meant, uh, is mentioned in the Bible. Just want to make sure you know the facts. But we, what we're talking about here is our hearts. Maybe it's not the situation in the Middle East that makes you break up your heart against God. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's, it's um, your relationships. Maybe it's, maybe it's just sorrow that you don't know what the future brings. I want to give you just a few seconds when I read in Psalms so you can open up your heart to God. When I read Psalms, it's a psalm I, I love so much because it's a psalm that fits our beloved gate. And when I read it to you, make sure you make some, th some thoughts. What is the bricks that you have in your heart? What's the name of the bricks you have? Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, the King of glory? The Lord almighty, he is the King of glory. The Lord wants to enter your gate. Daniel, tell us about your bricks. I'm, I'm a Jew. My mother comes from Israel. My father from Switzerland. I lived in Israel for seven years. At the moment, my brother lives in Israel with his two children. Fifteen years ago, I invited Jesus into my heart, and since then, he has been my daily companion. My wall is fear and anger. On October the 7th, I was on my way for vacation with my family. Suddenly, the news on my phone didn't stop. Slowly, details came about what was happening in Israel, a massacre. Hamas killed 1,400 innocent people and over 200 were kidnapped into Gaza. I was totally shocked. I was afraid. Afraid about my family, afraid, afraid about my brother, my people. I was angry at God. Why did you let this happen? What kind of people are they? There I was by the sea on a beautiful beach, but my, hair, my heart was etching. The wall of fear and anger grew larger and larger. On the second evening, I spoke to a colleague on the phone. I knew the only thing I could do now was to give it to God and to pray. So we went together before God. I could throw, ev throw everything at him on the cross. I screamed, I cried. And then suddenly I heard from God, pray for your enemies. I was thinking, but God, how do I do that? Why now? And he, say, he said to me, I'm the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. I knew I have to give my hand to Jesus. And with his help, I was able to start praying. Praying for Israel, for my brother, for my family. 
but also and mostly praying for the Palestinian people, for the Hamas people. Was it easy? No, not at all. But I noticed how, how the wall of fear is disappearing and the confidence and security comes into my heart. I no longer felt the wall of anger, but rather a deep peace, a strong desire for them to be able to meet Jesus in these dark times. It's a daily battle. I always wear a necklace with a star of David. When I go out, I think about hiding it. No one can see that I'm a Jew. The wall of fear is rising again. And then I go in front of the cross again. I give up this fear and the walls crumble and the confidence come into my heart. I don't always succeed. I have to give my anger, fear, or also my sadness to Jesus again and again. But Jesus gives me divine peace in my heart and in my everyday life. Thank you so much, Dania. Maybe it's not a conflict in the Middle East that is breaking your heart up, that is making your heart hard against the King of Kings. Maybe it's other things. But I want to introduce you to the God who helps us to get rid of it. What I believe there is one thing that is challenging us here in the East, uh, in the West, I want to say, in the Switzerland and other countries. And Jesus talked about it when they asked him about the end times. Jesus actually said in Luke 21, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a tra trap. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray. Did you hear it? Be always on the watch. We have it back here. Be on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus is also calling us to be awake, to be alert, to be on the watch for the times are close to the end. And when we let Jesus enter in our gates when we make sure that whatever is here in our hearts is not here anymore and we give it to Jesus, he will be able to enter and we won't have any fear when the King of Kings comes, when the King of Kings is entering through the gates. Make sure you bring everything that blocks against Jesus to the cross and make sure he can enter your heart today. What Jesus is talking about here is that we so easily get distracted. Maybe your brick is distraction. You're distracted, distracted what is happening on this planet. You don't realize what's going on. Jesus is inviting you to get new sight of what is happening, to be awake, to be alert. Make sure you give it to him. Maybe it's your handy, your smartphone, your social media. Maybe the sorrows of daily life that is distracting you from what's happening right now. Because Jesus wants to make sure we are alert. When he talked to his disciples, he told them what's going to happen. And those who listened, they could run out of Jerusalem. And what I want to make sure today is that we as an ICF church, we are alert when we see the signs of the end times. And we don't have hearts that are bricked up against the King of Kings because he is the one who brings hope for redemption in this situation. Is it easy for Dania to pray for the enemies? No, it's not. But is it, it's a way to open up the heart for the King of Glory. Let's stand this afternoon, church. I want to read to you from Revelations. And it's a challenging text, text but we make it our prayer this afternoon. Okay, it's a bit challenging. Don't take it personal, but I believe there's a message in it that is for us, and we should not be shy to also read those texts in our church, okay? 
Maybe you take it to your small group and you talk about it, you pray for each other. I know your deeds. That's one of the angels who comes to one of the churches of the ends and he says, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Isn't it true that sometimes you don't even realize how needy we are of God? I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. The true gold, actually, he's talking about. The true gold. And white clothes, not from Gucci, not from Prada, the real clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and solve to put on your eyes so you can see. We need God's touch to see what's happening. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. It's a sign that God loves you when he puts his finger on your trigger points, on the bricks you have in your heart. It's his love. Here I am, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Father, we stand here as your church here in Zurich, just a small part of your church worldwide, but a significant part because you love us, you honor us, you see our hearts today. You see how bricked up it sometimes is. You see our blindness. And we expose it to your light this afternoon. Thank you that you come as a redeemer, as a church who is filled with mercy. I ask you that you are merciful for me as well. Thank you for your mercy. You see how distracted we often are. You see the hatred in our hearts. You see the fear that we have and we expose it to you because you don't condemn us. You write into our hearts. It's It's still time for grace, church. It's still time of God's mercy. It's not the time where he comes back as the king of kings. It's time still to open up your heart for the for the for the soft king for the soft touch of the holy spirit thank you that you love us that you put your finger on what is what needs to be exposed in our lives jesus we want to be alert we want to be ready we want to learn from you how to be how to act in this situation we are in We want to learn from the Bible that your words matter. Give us wisdom, give us an alert mind, give us conscious mind where we live, what is happening in our situation. And I thank you, Jesus, that you will come with all your glory. And we want to worship you this afternoon. You are the King of Kings. And like Zacharias said, we want to be joyful because you will enter the gate of our hearts. You will enter the gates of Jerusalem. And there's going to be the time where we will worship for eternity. And that is the perspective of hope, of redemption in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, church. Let's worship this King of Kings who will come with all his glory with all the glory through the gates of your heart. Hey, thanks for watching. 
hey, our passion for people is that we see them grow in their relationship with Jesus, live fearlessly, and influence their people and the surrounding in a positive way. And if you would like to be part of that vision, we thank you so much for your financial support because that would make it possible. I hope that this message spoke to you really. And if you don't have subscribed to our channel, please do this. And it's always a big blessing. Maybe you know some people in your neighborhood or in your friendship. You say that podcast could be a very, very cool thing. Just share the link because it's pretty, pretty easy. And I'm looking forward to see you again. Tune in and God bless you and see you soon. Bye-bye.